Welcome to Sleepy Eyes. I am your host, Varga. I take you on a journey in the dark of the night with warm tales. Take a moment to relax your body and mind with the current calmness. Breathe deeply, feel the energy inside, and let go of any tiredness. Put aside the past and focus on the peacefulness of the present moment. Recognize any tension in your body. Allow it to fade away and unwind. Discover your inner peace and simply unwind in the tranquility of now. Before going to sleep, prepare to read a story comfortably in this peaceful setting. Let the magic of words captivate you as you get lost in a tale or story. With the warmth from this peace and relaxation, your sleep will become even more serene. Close your eyes, embark on a journey with a touch of words. Let each word guide you a bit deeper toward the essence of your inner peace. Now, relax and enjoy the pleasure of getting lost in the enchanting world of the story before drifting into sleep. Sherlock Holmes Short Stories Writer Sir Arthur Conan Doyle The Patient Part 1 One October evening, Sherlock Holmes and I were returning to our rooms in Baker Street after a long walk. I had been sharing rooms with Holmes since the death of my wife in 1894. It was quite late in the evening, but there was a carriage outside the house. A gentleman was waiting for us in our sitting room. He stood up when we came in. He was about 33 or 34 years old, with thin, artist's hands, and looked unhealthy and tired. He was dressed completely in black. Good evening, Holmes said to him cheerfully. Please sit down, again. What can I do to help you? My name is Dr. Percy Trevelyan, said our visitor, and I live at 403 Brook Street. You have written a book on catalepsy, haven't you? I asked. Dr. Trevelyan was very pleased and proud that I knew his book. His pale face became quite red. I thought that the book had been completely forgotten, he said. Very few copies were sold. I suppose you are a doctor yourself, sir? I used to be an army doctor, I replied, and after that I was in private practice for a few years. My own special interest has always been catalepsy, he said. I would like to work more on that disease, but one must take what one can get. I must not talk too much about my own interests, though. I realize that your time is valuable, Mr. Holmes. Well, some very strange things have been happening recently at the house in Brook Street, and tonight they have reached such a point that I felt that I had to come and ask for your advice and your help. Sherlock Holmes sat down and lit his pipe. You are very welcome to both, he said. Please give me a complete account of the things that are worrying you. Tell me all the details. Some of them are very unimportant, said Dr. Trevelyan, but the affair is so difficult to understand that I will tell you the whole story. I am a London University man. I won several prizes at the university, and my teachers thought that I would become a very successful doctor. I continued my studies afterwards, worked at King's College Hospital, and wrote my book on catalepsy. But gentlemen, I had no money. A man who wants to become a specialist must live in the expensive area round Cavendish Square. There are only about twelve possible streets, and the rents are extremely high. One also has to hire a horse and carriage, and buy furniture for one's house. I would have needed ten years to be able to save the necessary money, but suddenly I had a great surprise. A stranger came to see me one day, in my room at King's College Hospital. This gentleman's name was Blessington. Are you the man who has won so many prizes? He asked. Yes, I am, I said, shaking his hand. I want to ask you some questions, he said. First of all, have you any bad habits? Do you drink too much? Really, sir, I cried. Please don't be angry, he said. I had to ask you that question, 
Why are you not working as a private specialist? I suppose you haven't enough money. I will help you. I will rent a house for you in Brook Street. I must have looked as surprised as I felt. Oh, I'm making you this offer to help me, not just you, he said. I will be honest with you. I have a few thousand pounds that I am not using. I want to use it to help you to establish a private practice. But why? I asked him. Because I want my money to grow, he replied. What must I do then? I asked. I just want you to do your job, he said. I will buy the furniture for your house, pay the rent, and pay all your costs each week. You can keep a quarter of the money you earn. You will give me the other three quarters. It was a strange offer, Mr. Holmes, but I accepted it. A few weeks later I moved into the house in Brook Street. Mr. Blessington came to live there too. He said that his heart was weak. He needed to live near a doctor. He turned the best two rooms into a bedroom and a sitting room for himself. He had strange habits. He seemed to have no friends and very rarely went out. Regularly every evening, he came into my consulting room to find out how much I had earned. He then took all the money and gave me back exactly a quarter of it. The rest of the money he kept in the strong box in his bedroom. I have been very successful as a specialist, Mr. Holmes, and in the last year or two I have made him a rich man. A few weeks ago Mr. Blessington came down to speak to me. He mentioned a recent London robbery. He seemed to be surprisingly worried and anxious, and he wanted to get stronger locks put on our doors and windows. He remained in this strange state of anxiety for a week. He never stopped looking out of the window and did not go out at all. He seemed to be living in terrible fear of something or of somebody, but when I asked him about this he answered me very rudely. Then slowly he seemed to forget his fears. A recent event, though, has brought all his fears back again. Two days ago I received a letter, which I will read to you. There is no address or date on it. Dear Dr. Trevelyan, I am a Russian lord, but I now live in England. For some years I have been suffering from catalepsy. As you are a great and well-known brain specialist, I would like to consult you. I will call on you at about a quarter past six tomorrow evening, and hope that is convenient for you. Of course I, as waiting in my consulting room at that time the following evening, because catalepsy is a rare disease, and I was extremely interested. The Russian was a thin old man who did not look very much like a lord. There was a young man with him. He was tall and good-looking, with a dark, strong face and very powerful arms and chest. He gently supported the old man with a hand under his arm as they entered. Then he helped him to sit down. Please forgive me for coming in with my father, doctor, said this young man. His voice was that of a foreigner. That is quite all right, I replied. Would you like to stay with your father while I examine him? No, thank you, he answered. I will go back into the waiting room. Then the young man went out, and I turned to the older man to begin discussing his illness. He did not seem very intelligent, and he did not speak English very well, so it was difficult. Suddenly, he stopped answering my questions. I saw that he was sitting very stiffly and looking at me with strange, empty eyes. He was in a state of catalepsy. Of course, as a professional, I was excited. I examined him very carefully and took notes on his condition. He seemed to be in exactly the same state as other people who have the illness. I decided to treat him with some medicine that I believed to be helpful to such conditions. The bottle was in my storeroom, which is behind the consulting room, so I went out to get it. Unfortunately, it took me five minutes to find the bottle. Then I went back into my consulting room. Mr. Holmes, the old man, was not there. The waiting room was empty, too. The servants had heard nothing. Mr. Blessington, who had been out for a short walk, came in soon afterwards, but
but I did not tell him about the strange disappearance of my Russian patient. Well, I did not think the Russians would ever come back, but this evening, again at a quarter past six, they both came into my office. I am very sorry that I left so suddenly yesterday, doctor, said the old man. I was certainly surprised, I replied. I can explain it, he said. When my catalepsy goes away, my mind is always empty. I do not remember what has been happening. Yesterday I woke up, confused, in a strange room. I did not know where I was, so I simply got up and walked out into the street. And when I saw my father come out of your consulting room, said the son, I thought that the examination was over. I did not realize what had really happened until we had reached home. Well, I said laughing, I understand everything now. I turned to the older man. I will continue the examination now, sir, if you wish. For about half an hour I discussed the old gentleman's illness with him and gave him the best advice I could. Then he and his son went away. Mr. Blessington, who often went for a walk at that time of day, came in soon afterwards and went up to his rooms. A moment later I heard him running down again and he rushed into my consulting room. He seemed to be almost crazy with fear. Who has been in my rooms? He cried. No one, I said. That is a he, he shouted. Come up and look. I went up with him, and he pointed to several footprints on the floor. Those are certainly not the marks of my feet, Mr. Blessington said. They were much larger and seemed to be quite fresh. As you know, it rained hard this afternoon, and the two Russians were my only visitors. The younger man must have gone up to Mr. Blessington's room, but why? Nothing at all was missing. I was shocked to see that Mr. Blessington was crying. He could hardly speak, but he mentioned your name, and of course I came here immediately. He will be so grateful if you can come back with me now, in my carriage. Holmes said nothing. He simply gave me my hat, picked up his own, and followed Dr. Trevelyan out of the room. A quarter of an hour later, we arrived at the house in Brook Street. A servant let us in, but suddenly somebody turned off the light in the hall. We heard the person say in a frightened voice, I have a gun. If you come any nearer, I will shoot you. This is very stupid behavior, Mr. Blessington, cried the doctor angrily. Oh, it is you, doctor, said the voice. But who are these other gentlemen? He lit the gas light again and examined us carefully. He was a very fat man, but had once been much fatter. The skin hung loosely on his face, which looked very unhealthy. He had thin red hair. At last he put his gun back into his pocket and said, It's all right now. You may come up. I hope I have not upset you. How do you do, Mr. Holmes? You must advise me. I suppose that Dr. Trevelyan has told you what has happened. 